Jesus And I see my Savior With love in His eyes His body broken With no sin to hide I see my Jesus Eyes blind with blood His face is crimson His cry is love Come on, sing it out with me No wonder we call you
to me I really enjoy going to the airport because I am a people watcher I don't know about you but sometimes I well I used to I used to go to Walmart just to watch people anybody like that me no I'm the only one uh, but I, I just like watching people I like going places where there'll be strange people I, I just like watching people and their, their interesting habits and the airport is is full of interesting people um, when April and I first started dating we used to go to the airport 
and what a fun time we had. We got to just know each other and, and talk. So airports are big for me. And the first week we talked about um, de destinations and how, how God has taken us someplace as a church. That he's taken us to a place of, of compassion. He's taken us to a place. And we have to make sure that we're, we're, we, 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 we watch out for any kind of delays. That delays can stop us. Sometimes you, you can be believing God for something, but what do you do between what do you want from God and what you currently have? So we talked about delays. The next thing we talked about was destinations, that, that God's leading us somewhere. We talked last week about being seated with God. I got a prop real quick. And how you got to find the right seat and how where you're seated is, is, is very, very important. And we talked about taking a, a seat of a servant and how that is so much needed. And tonight I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. I'm, I'm, I don't know if I can make it through it. I don't have my assistant this week. Uh, I don't know what happened to him, but he was supposed to be here to help me with this message. I'm um, hoping next time we do church online, he'll be here. But I want to read this passage of scripture as we're talking about tonight's message. And it's the story of Terah. And, and Terah, if you don't know, he is the father of Abraham. And, and I talked about this before, but it says, this is the account of Terah's family, Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran was the father of Lot. So it, the Bible is starting off by telling us the story of this, this patriarchal family. It goes on, then it says, But Haran died in Ur of Chaldeans, the land of his birth, while his father Terah was still living. This is very, very significant because this may be the first actual account of a child dying before the parent. So now this this, this guy, Tara, he, he, he has a kid, and it doesn't say exactly how Haran has passed away, but we see he is now dead, and, and I can't imagine how tragic this moment was. The Bible doesn't say how he died. It could have been accidental. It could have been, it could have been natural. We, we don't know what it was. It goes on, verse, verse 29 says, Meanwhile, Abram and Nahor both married. The names of Abram's wife was Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife was Malka. Malka and her sister Issachar were daughters of Nahor's brother Haran. Verse 30. But Sarai was unable to become pregnant and had no children. So we all understand that Sarai becomes Sarah and Abram becomes Abraham. But this is, this is before all those things happened. This is like the prequel. This, this, is, like, uh, this is like before. It's, it's kind of like if they came out with Stranger Things part 0.5. It, was, it would happen before all those other things happened. This is a prequel to everything else that happened before. Verse 31. One day... Terah took his son Abram, this one I want to focus on, his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, his grandson Lot, his son Haran's child, and moved away from Ur of the Chaldeans. He was headed for the land of Canaan. But they stopped at Haran and settled there. I just want to kind of point out that Terah was headed somewhere. And something happened that caused him to settle and not end up the place that God had desired for him to go or, or the place that he desired to set out. And, and then it goes on and it says, verse 32, it says, Terah lived for 205 years and died while still in Haran. My prayer for you is that you live not just a long life, but you end up living a fulfilled life. That God has plans and purposes for you. And I don't want you to stop and settle for where you are currently. But I want you to move forward and become and, and do all the things that God has for you. So the question is, what stops us? What, what stops us from becoming the people or the person that God desires us to be? The Bible says that we're changed from faith to faith, from glory to glory. So the question is, how do we stop or what stops us? And I believe the topic for tonight is what stops us is, is baggage. It's baggage. As we, as we talk about an airport and we talk about traveling through an airport, we talk about destinations and seats. And now we just want to talk and talk tonight about baggage. John 4, 16, Jesus 
this encountering this woman of Samaria, this woman, Samaritans and Jews have no dealings. They, they should not get along. It's, it's two different races. What's, what an what a, a, a important message for right now. So Jews and Samaritans now getting together, which should not happen. And it says, and Jesus has a conversation with this woman. And he answers her and says, he told her, go and call your husband and come back. Verse 17, I have no husband, she replies. So he's, she's talking about in the present tense. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. Verse 18, the fact is you have had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. In this one verse, Jesus connects her past with a present. That he saw her and also saw her baggage. And tonight... I want to give you my baggage testimony. How, how I got to where I was. See, I was born in, in Trinidad, um, and then we moved to Brooklyn, New York. And in Brooklyn, New York, I was, I was completely normal. And then we moved to, to St. Thomas, and I, I, I was kind of normal, but I was, I was a little different. I, I got made fun of because I wasn't from, from St. Thomas. I was from the mainland. Then I moved to it. Atlanta, Georgia, and when I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, the thing that was crazy is I had an accent. And on the first day of school, they kind of they called on all the kids, and it was October when I moved there. And they're going around the room asking kids different things, and they call on me, "Hey, hey, you, what's your name?" And I say, "Marie." And they go, "Marie." I'm like, "No, it's Marie." And they go, "Morris." I'm like, "No, it's not Morris. It's Marie." And they go, "Marie D." I'm like, "No, it's not Marie. It's Marie." And they kind of laugh, and everyone kind of chuckles. And then I speak, and they say, hey, what's today's date? And I say, oh, it's October the 3rd. <laughs> it's October. And everyone in the room looks at me. And that was the day that I picked up shame. That, that, that who I was wasn't good enough for the people around me. And I, and I began to live this, this lifestyle of I had to do other things to make, to deflect from what I, what I wanted to hide. And I, I became what we would call a, ch a chameleon. I, I just simply wanted to, to fit in. About the fourth grade, my, my, my dad became a, addicted to, to crack cocaine. And the, the crazier part about that was, um, I remember one time we went to the movies and, and we're all enjoying the movies as a family. And then my dad asked my mom to go and get something out of the car. And when he went to the car, the movie kind of ended, and my dad still wasn't back. And when we got outside, he was gone. And now my mom, my two sisters, we have to walk home. Three miles, we're walking, it's, it's nighttime. We finally get to our house, and, and we don't have the keys. My dad, my dad is completely gone. I, I, I'm, I'm in fourth grade. I had to break into my own house to get to be able to sleep that night. We, we sleep, and the next day I, I go to class, and I'm, I'm sleepy. I have all these things going on, and I, I'm frustrated. My teacher asked me a question, and, and I respond the, the wrong way. But I had some baggage. That, 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 that the life I was living at home was not a good one. I also remember um, uh, back in the day, they had these things called um, uh, Walkmans. Come on, somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Technology. This was technology. What? Music in your pocket? It's crazy. And we have finally got a, a, a new Walkman, and this Walkman was special. David Wright, this Walkman had a bass, a bass button. You hit that bass button? What? Super bass. It was funny because we had a Walkman. Somehow this, this theory got, this, this thought got passed around that if your batteries ran dead, you put your batteries in the freezer and they'll, re, they'll recharge. Anybody try that? Anybody? Okay, this is me. All right. So I had a Walkman, and, and the family we were so excited. We got a Walkman for Christmas, and, and we got to play with this Walkman. But the crazy part about that is my, my dad took this very own, the very Walkman that my mom had taken her money to buy, and, and he sold the Walkman. And now I had this, this weird thought about myself that I, I got to protect my possessions. Everyone's out to get you. And that day I, I picked up mistrust. 
that, that I was I was already shameful. I was already suffering some things at home, and I had some I had some home life baggage. And now me personally, I had some mistrust. I'm like, I cannot let anybody get close to me because people who get close to me will hurt me. I was struggling. Life, life began to, to, to progress, and I'm, I'm going through life with, with, with this baggage. In fact, I, I fell in love with this, this sport. When I was in the, when I was in the, 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 the fifth grade, um, I began to watch college basketball on TV. And at, at that time, the, the best team who played, the best college basketball team was a team that was located in North Carolina. And the, the name of their coach was uh, Coach K. Come on. Um, one one brave soul clap. <laughs> I fell in love with with Coach K. Mel, I'm sorry. And and he he would come on on Saturday. He have all these drills to do, and I, I found myself practicing these drills. And and I, I was I was falling in love with this sport called basketball. And one day it was Friday. Every every Friday I would walk to the basketball co court. And one day I was walking to the basketball court, and his car stops. And this guy, who, this guy offered to give me a ride. An older guy offered to give me a ride. But while we were headed to the basketball court, while he was driving me there, he grabbed me. And he touched me. And I told myself, Marie, why didn't you do something? You should have just punched that guy in his face. But I sat in that car paralyzed. I continued going through high school with this baggage of, of shame, this baggage of regret, baggage of mistrust, just trying to live my life. I became a Christian. Gave my life to the Lord, but guess what I held on to? This. In fact, I was I, I got I got to be a part of an amazing church when we lived in America's Georgia. And we loved it. And then one day God told God spoke to my wife and I, he said, Hey, you guys should should move and go someplace else. And we we told our pastors that in our church who we, we thought loved us decided to talk bad about us. And instead of walking in love about it with us, they decided to, to backbite and, and, and do all these crazy things to us. And now I'm walking around, going through life, not only being hurt by unsaved people, but now I'm walking around with church hurt baggage. That maybe you're, you're listening to this and you've been hurt by church folks. And, and this, is a heavy, this is a heavy bag to carry. Because, man, the people who are called to love you, love the unlovable somehow have backbitten back the very people that God has called them to love. And church baggage is the worst baggage. That if you can't trust a fellow believer or a pastor or a preacher, man, it's tough. Struggle. Man, in the midst of all that, we moved to Oklahoma. God blessed us. Three kids, beautiful wife. Then I had a son. And now I realized that I want to be the dad my son never had. I want to be the exact opposite of my own dad. And that day when my son was born and, and having three kids and a beautiful wife, I picked up the baggage of trying to be the provider for my family. And I, 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 want, to, I want to say that, of course, the man's supposed to be, provide. But men, we can't be, be the provider if we don't go to the provider himself. That we can't take the place of Jesus in our family's life. That, that we have to be spiritual authorities in our household. And I took on the baggage of trying to do it all myself. And now I'm trying to be a man for my family. With all this baggage, I live life. This is what I've learned as a pastor is that the people that you see every single day, if you can see into the spiritual realm, they would look just like this. My encouragement to every single person that hears my voice is understand that we're all broken. We 
all have issues. And that God has called us as believers to look beyond what's normally seen and see that people are struggling. He's called us to see. In fact, Scripture says, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along her were also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. He, he, sees a, he sees a procession happening, and now our Jesus is moved with compassion. It goes on, and we see when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. We serve a God who sees. And it goes on and says, and he went along. He saw a, ma a man blind from birth. We serve a Jesus who sees all of our baggage, and yet he loves us anyway. He loves us anyway. You know, I just think about us, me being in the airport. One time we were moving from, from Tulsa to Kentucky, or we are going somewhere, and, and we're traveling through the airport with, with three kids, car seats, and we are struggling like crazy. I don't know if anyone ever had this, and we are struggling like crazy. I want to tell you, everywhere around you, there are people struggling. And God's called us to see, because he is a God that sees. In fact, he told this blind man, he says, as he went along, he saw, a, he saw a man blind from birth. And Jesus heals this blind man that he says to him, he says this, he says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. We serve a God who sees. You may be in this, this grass, hearing my voice, and all the baggage that I talked about, you're thinking about your own baggage. How God sees you, and he cares. Compassion is not a weakness. It's the strength of the believer. Do not listen to the rhetoric of the hypercritical social media that's taking place right now. God's position for you is a place of compassion for people, mask or unmask. We love people because we are the church. We love people because we are the church. Hear me. We're living in a lost and dying world, and God needs you to position yourself in a position of power, and that power is simply compassion for people who are struggling just to make it. The good news is Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The good news is if you're struggling tonight, God will give you rest. He goes on and he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. I love how the Passion Translation says it. It says, are you weary, carrying a heavy burden? Then come to me. I will refresh your life. For I am your oasis, and an oasis is, is, is important in a dry and de desert place. Jesus is saying to you right now that he is your oasis. Join your life with mine. Learn my ways, and you'll discover that I am gentle, humble, easy to please, for you will find refreshment and rest in me. The question is, how do you know when you're carrying something that you should not be carrying, when that thing becomes a burden? What are you holding on to? What are you dragging around that you simply need to let go of today? I close with this, this scripture. Pour all your worries and stress upon him and leave them there. If Jesus is painting a picture of you taking all your stress, 
all your anxieties, all your worries, all the things that concern you, all the things that keep you up at night, all the things that you think you can't handle, the things that you thought you were born into that you could never get off, get over. He's saying, pour all your worries and stress upon him. It's, it's, it's his victory that makes us victorious. It's his cross that gives us, gives us life. The Bible says we exchange our lives for his. And he offers us new life and, and restoration for our souls. But the challenge for us sometimes is to simply let go of the things you've already been holding on to. And he says, and leave them there. For he always tenderly cares for you. The invitation tonight should be a simple one. The invitation tonight is simply to lay down all those things that you have no business carrying. It's time to be healed from things of your childhood, things of your past, your family, Situations that happen to you that are completely unfair, God sees you. He sees you as you are. With every eye, with every head bow, every eye closed. This is your moment. This is your chance. And I believe the Spirit of God is already dealing with you. That's it's that thing. That thing you thought of right away, that, that situation you thought of right away, that circumstance you thought of right away, that family situation right away, God is saying, let that thing go. It's time to rest. What COVID has taught me is there's always going to be drama. There's always going to be the next thing. Murder hornets. Sierra dust, what do you call it? Dust. Meteors, in the middle of everything the world throws at us, Jesus simply offers us rest. And if you would say, Pastor Marie, that's me. I've held on to some things for so long that I just need to let those things go. That I am a believer, but I, I still kept my baggage from the past. And you're saying, hey, Pastor Marie, tonight, symbolically, when I raise my hand, I am saying, God, take it. I'm laying it down. On the count of three, that's you. If, 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 this, this, this is you. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. God sees you. One, two, three. Raise your hand. I see you. God sees you. Put your hands down. God, I thank you for every person that raised their hands. That in you, Father God, there is rest. In you, there's hope. In you, there's restoration, Lord God. I pray, Father God, that we stop living our lives in our own strength, Father God, but we, we realize that all our strength comes from you. That your word gives us life, Lord God. That your word gives us strength, Lord God. That we want to be refreshed in our souls and our minds, Father God. God, give us sweet rest when we lay down our heads tonight, Lord God. That our minds aren't racing about all these different things, but we can be wholly devoted and fully devoted followers of you. God, I thank you that all the promises of God are yes and amen. And God, tonight we claim your promises of peace, of restoration, peace that the world can't give, Lord God. God, I thank you for what you've already done 2,000 years ago for us and what you currently do on the inside of us, Lord God, right now and what you desire to do through us. God, we love you, we honor you, and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' wonderful name. And everyone said amen. Hey, give a round of applause. Everyone who took a step.